Welcome to the second month of Maddie's Baking Book Club. This month, February 2023, I invited everyone to read the book uh, When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Barnhill along with me and then create something if you wanted to join in the fun. So first today, I'm going to show you my When Women Were Dragons inspired bake, the recipe, the tutorial, all of that. And following that, I'm going to have a little discussion about the book with my sister-in-law, Caitlin. So first up, I am making a macaron today inspired by this book. And as you can see here, I'm using a dark green color for my shell. And I have a powdered food coloring in my meringue. I am using a French meringue as I often do in my home kitchen with a really small batch of macarons like this, just whipping that to a really nice stiff peak before I continue on with adding in the dry ingredients and the macronage process. I really like to transfer my meringue into a larger, wider bowl and then incorporate in the dry ingredients in about three additions. I get the question so often, can I macronage in a mixer? Do you macronage in a mixer? And the answer is absolutely yes, I do. Personally, I think for two reasons I like showing the hand, mixing by hand on my channel is that I think, first of all, it's important to learn how to do it by hand so you know exactly what to look for when you go to do it in your mixer and I also think that for me personally I like macronaging in my mixer if I'm doing a really large batch so for me something that's small like 100 grams or 150 grams of egg whites as I do for most of my tutorials and videos um, it is just so fast and easy to do by hand so that is why you see me doing this way but I'll show you soon in another video how you can do the macronage in the mixer if you want to know more about that so what I'm doing here is I am just incorporating all of the dry ingredients before getting onto that macronage while I'll fold and kind of press the batter into the sides of the bowl just to deflate some of the air from the meringue before I get to the ribbon stage. Now I am going for kind of a deep, I'm using the Soldier Green by the Sugar Art Master Elite's line of food coloring, um, and, but because my theme for this book inspired bake is a garden i wanted it to be a little bit more of a natural but not completely solid color of green so after i get the macronage completely finished i am going to use some gel food coloring in a different shade of green and i'm going to use the plastic wrap method to paint some of the gel food coloring on onto my plastic wrap, put the batter on it, and then pipe my macaron shells. There are a lot of ways to create kind of swirl macaron shells or like tie-dye macaron shells. I've demonstrated that in a lot of my other previous videos. So if you are more curious about the method that I'm going to be using or how else you could use different types of food coloring to create a multicolored shell, make sure to scroll through my previous videos and check those out. As you can see, I've gotten to that ribbon stage. My batter is flowing really nicely in a smooth ribbon like shape down back into my bowl. Now I've got my plastic wrap and I'm going to paint on some 
gel food colorant i was using powder before but now i'm using gel i am always a bit hesitant when i do this i don't want to add too much because moisture is the nemesis of macarons but i think it was maybe a little bit too little <laughs> for my macaron gels the first couple as i was piping them you'll see in a minute didn't really show up really clearly so my advice to you if you are trying this method is be generous in the amount of gel food coloring you put onto your plastic wrap um yeah like it's okay just just go for it <laughs> then i'm gonna roll this up like a burrito and get it into my piping bag Okay, I have that burrito wrapped macaron batter in my piping bag. I usually use an 803 or an 804 Ateco piping tip, but you can use whatever feels the most comfortable for you. I also am using a sill pad here, and then I just have my own paper template underneath that. Again, there are so many different brands and styles of silicone baking mats and of um, Teflon baking sheets and all different kinds of things you could be baking on. So so really use what works best for you in your kitchen, whatever that is. It's completely fine if it's not the same as what I'm doing. Now, as you can see here, I'm just piping regular circles. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I'm going to put some pretty epic um, royal icing decoration on these macarons after they Bake. These macarons, of course, are inspired by the book When Women Were Dragons, and this book was a little bit challenging to create something from because there are very few references to food food um the mom in the story does is referenced in like cooking for her husband um there are some mentions of you know the dad drinking a lot there is mention of the girl later on in the story having to provide for her sister um and doing it on a very 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 minimal budget and with the groceries that the dad gets and you know so there are times when there was food mentioned but it was not in like a really really descriptive beautiful decadent way as it was in january's book arsenic and adobo so i'm just piping all of these circles i want to tap my trays leave them out so they can rest then i'll get them into my oven and bake them like normal 300 degrees for about 16 to 18 minutes is what i like to do in my kitchen of course do what works the best for you in yours so after those are baked, I'm going to get in here with a bunch of different colors of royal icing because I'm going to create kind of a garden scene. So I've got some different greens. I've got some regular piping bags, um, some with some like leaf tips, and then I've got some white here and some yellow because I'm going to create some royal icing bees to transfer onto the macaron gardens once they're dry so i've got some white there in a really really stiff consistency and i just i made like a million because i wasn't exactly sure what style was going to work for me so i did a bunch of different versions different sizes of wings different shapes and sizes of the body different kinds of like painted stripes on there um and at first i was like like, oh no, Maddie, what have you done? This is a terrible idea. You should have planned this more. Um, but they turned out so cute and I'm obsessed with them. Then let's go back and while those are drying, create some vines on these macaron shells. So I'm going in first with one color. I have a lighter green and then a darker green. And I'm just going to create a couple different lines in each, then go in after that and with the piping bags that have piping tips with a bit stiffer consistency i am just using um like a leaf tip so i can create tiny little leaves um if you don't have tiny leaf piping tips that's completely fine just cut a little triangle out of the end of your piping bag and just make sure that you have a really nice stiff consistency and you shouldn't have any problems 
So the reason I am making little gardens on my macaron shells with bees, <laughs> you might be thinking it's very silly, the family unit that we're reading about in this book and we're hearing the perspective from the girl, the child in the family, and she is observing everything happening around her and especially what is going on with her mom. And at one point in the book, the mom who um, did not become a dragon during the mass dragoning event in which a lot of women transformed from human women into dragons and flew away, the mom stayed. And you can tell that it was a challenging maybe decision for her. And I'll talk about this more with <laughs> Caitlin later, but... The mom at one point does this kind of mini rebellion in the form of a garden. And it's quite clear in the story that the her husband, the man, would not have been okay with the garden and really was not okay with it, but she didn't ask. She just did it. And therefore, she didn't need his permission. It was a very, very um, kind of hilarious to me moment in which she was just like I'm doing this it's for me it's for my girls it's for my family and he can't say no if I don't ask and so it was just this really lovely form of this woman kind of doing what she needed to do to get by and to take care of herself and to stay strong and to be there for her family so she creates this garden in her backyard and the husband, her husband, the man, the dad of the girl who's telling the story, um, we learn that he not only hates the garden, he hates that it brings bees. And so to me, creating these little garden kind of themed shells was a nod both to the mom and kind of her strength and why she was creating this garden, but then also just the fact that the dad really hated it but also like wasn't able to do anything about it. <laughs> so anyway, that was my inspiration here. So I'm just going in, sticking to those same two colors, following the vines that I piped in each one. Um, I think you could go in right away and do like one color and pipe those leaves and then do the other one. But because I wanted everything to be really kind of tangled up in each other and crazy, I decided to pipe all of the vines first on all of my shells, gave them kind of a minute to dry so nothing smeared around and then I went in with the leaves after that. If you are new to royal icing but this is something you want to play around with more please check out um, my intro to royal icing. I have a couple videos dedicated to simple designs you can do to start experimenting with royal icing specifically on your macaron shells. It's not something I'm a complete expert in. Um, I do a lot of experimenting myself, but it's something I really, really love to do and I think it can bring your macarons to the next level. All right, so after those leaves have dried a bit, I'm just placing one little bee on some of my macaron tails. Seriously, how cute is that? I just love this overall look. Um, I think it is really true to the story and also just a cute macaron anyway. Okay, the next thing that was inspired by this book and kind of the moment in this book, I'm going to make a ganache. I'm using both white and dulce chocolate, which is kind of a caramelized or like a blonde chocolate. Um, and then I'm making an herb honey lemon chocolate ganache and so that's why i decided to have the dulce chocolate in there just to i don't know kind of add a little bit more depth as well with all of these really bright flavors going in there i didn't really want the white chocolate to feel too sweet i wanted this to be really earthy um so that was why i made that decision i'm adding in some honey that's kind of a nod to the bee in the garden i have some basil and 
mint that I infused into my cream and I'll add some in later as well some of the fresh herbs along with some lemon zest um, the lemon is just for balance and some brightness in there and the herbs are again just kind of a nod to this garden that the mom is keeping in her own garden because I really wanted to have it a little bit unique and crazy I had both the basil and mint in there along with the honey and lemon honestly i think it turned out a lot better than i expected as you'll see later i really like this experiment i don't usually use basil and mint together in my pastry so it was a really fun experiment to do usually when i use basil in my pastry i often will pair it with like strawberry other berry kind of things um and mint is something i use more with like dark chocolate so this was really fun to experiment with using fresh herbs in a kind of white chocolate ganache with that citrusy kind of note to it i am using the pastry cream style ganache here you can see this in so many of my recipes and tutorials so i had some cream with cornstarch and the rest of the cream i have with some sugar and the honey in my saucepan then after that heated up a bit i tempered everything together um and then i'm cooking it just like a pastry cream if this feels too complicated or stressful you can take all of these same flavor notes and do a more basic white chocolate ganache you know chocolate cream tiny bit of butter um, and still do all of these things you can add a bit of honey to that you can add you can infuse the cream with basil and mint you can add in lemon zest all of that will be exactly the same so if you do not want to use this method for your ganache that's absolutely okay as soon as this thickens up i'm going to transfer it and pour it over my chocolates generally when i'm using this style of ganache i like to warm up my chocolate just a little bit so that the cream doesn't have to work quite so hard in melting it down After I transfer all of that thickened cream over my white and dulcy chocolate, I'm going to give it a nice stir and then just let it rest and cool down until it is warm, is not hot, so kind of just above room temperature usually for me making a small batch like this that's about uh, 16 to 20 minutes um, and then I will start emulsifying in my butter using an immersion blender. Finally, after all of that, I'm going to add in some more chopped fresh mint, fresh basil, and lemon zest. If you are experiencing difficulties, this is a more technically challenging ganache. It could be because you heated the cream too much it could be because you're adding in the butter too early um or it could be that your ingredients just weren't all at the right temperatures respectively so again really pay attention is your butter at room temperature were your chocolate slightly warm did you cook your cream until it was thick but not continue going for ever and really really heat it did you cook it on too high of a temperature it is quite temperature sensitive all right i'm going to emulsify in my butter here again get this all nice and smooth and creamy then set it aside so it can cool completely before i fill my macaron shells
since both the ganache is cooled room temperature and the royal icing decorations have completely dried and hardened out that could take a couple hours um it could be shorter than that or longer than that depending on how thick your designs are then it's time to fill your macarons and get them into your refrigerator or freezer to mature completely if you are new to working with royal icing definitely make sure that you are giving it enough time to dry and harden because if your royal icing is wet um, or still very moist inside when you go to mature them things can turn out a little bit sideways i am obsessed with this end result the ganache paired so well with the theme and design it was really fun and different i loved all of the vines and leaves and those cute little bees hiding everywhere i think it was a really really great pairing with this book when women were dragons and i'm really excited to see what everybody else creates stay tuned right after this i'll be talking with caitlin about this book all of our thoughts what happens what we liked what we didn't like all of that so if you have not read the book if you do not want any spoilers make sure to stop listening now otherwise continue on with us find out all of our thoughts and make sure to go over to instagram and search the hashtag maddie's baking book club if you want to see what other people have created inspired by this book. Thank you so much for watching. On to the book discussion. Hi, Caitlin. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, I am Caitlin Brame. I know Maddie because I am married to her brother. <laughs> Yay. And I love books and I work with books and I also specifically love folklore and books that sort of draw on folk tales and mythology and sort of get kind of in those directions. Mm -hmm. So that's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so when we were thinking about what book for us to read as a part of this book club, we had gone and kind of thrown a couple ideas out and then you had suggested when we were dragons, um, mm -hmm. how did you land upon this? How did you discover this one? Yeah, well, that one, it came out in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was aware of it just because it was kind of like mentioned in a bunch of places mm -hmm. as like a new book out and people were excited about it and then were reading about it. And it actually was named on a couple best books of 2022 lists. Mm -hmm. um, so I am a library girly. I, as soon as it was on pre-order, I put it on hold at the library. But then, of course, you have to wait a little bit, yep. which is fine for me because it helps me manage my TBR. So, like, <laughs> that's a different story. Um, and actually, in the meantime, sometimes I will read uh, digital review copies in advance mm -hmm. of something being published. Mm -hmm. And I read a digital review copy while I was waiting for When Women Were Dragons, Um also by Kelly Barnhill called The Crane Husband. Oh, which yes. A novella that I think actually comes out this month in February. Okay. Um, and it was so good. And I like didn't even realize it was the same author until yeah. I was like partway through. But um, Kelly Barnhill just has, like, I feel like she has a really deep knowledge of folklore, yeah. but just kind of sprinkles it. <laughs> okay. And she doesn't okay. like over explain the folkloric elements. They're just yeah. sort of there. Yeah. Like, it, you know, sort of thing. So I was really excited for it when women were dragons. And I was like, Maddie, this is also <laughs> on my list. So that's good for you. <laughs> yeah. And I was really excited. Um, you mentioned it. And then it was very easy to find because it is new and it's everywhere. So that was exciting. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit what is this book all about? Yeah. So it takes place in the late 1950s and 60s and actually spans a couple decades, but yeah. the most of it is centered around this event that happened in 1955 called the Mass Dragoning. Mm -hmm. And like in the Mass Dragoning, inexplicably, hundreds of thousands, I think, mm -hmm. or like thousands and thousands of women across the United States spontaneously turned into dragons and flew away and disappeared. Mm -hmm. 
And so this is the premise. Our main character, Alex, Mm -hmm. is a child when this happens, which is really interesting because we, like, at first get this understanding from a child point of view who, like, doesn't really know what's happening. Yes. And it's also happening in, like, the late 50s. So, like, the women who are turning into dragons are, like, housewives who are disappearing from that, like, traditional nuclear family structure. Yeah. Um, so obviously it's like this metaphor for, you know, like women's suppression in the nuclear family. And, yeah. um, there are also, uh, elements of queer, um, uh-huh. Uh-huh. themes that come up too, because like, how does like a queer person fit into this like rigid family structure? Um, and yeah, so like the story is kind of just this girl, Alex's understanding uh-huh. of like her aunt actually yeah turned into a dragon and disappeared her mother did not yeah and so like what is happening here and like how has the world changed yeah. and interestingly the um the government is very much like this happened but we don't talk about it <laughs> and like this is the only time it's ever happened and it's never going to happen again and those women who turned into dragons and left are like shame on them and bad people yep. and like yep. if that happened in your family you don't You're, want to talk about it yep, either. It's not good for you. I yeah. I thought that though all of those elements combined really made sense as to why it was written and published in 2022. And then also mm-hmm. talking about the 50s, it felt like there were so many elements about like what was happening then and like historical moments and things that were happening and then also like very relevant to the present day. And it just mm-hmm. felt like there were a lot of things going on that even though, you know, it was told from a child's perspective and there were a lot of metaphorical elements, it was still mm-hmm. like, okay, yep, I I can see that represented in my life. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. it's a lot about, like, righteous anger. Like, yeah. it's kind of talked about, like, they don't know why these women turned into dragons or, like, what exactly happened there, but it seems to be connected to anger a yes. lot of the time throughout the story. So, yeah. That also ties in very much to now, <laughs> especially over the past couple of years. Of like, there's a lot of righteous anger here, and yeah. it's like large forces are telling us that that's not good to uh-huh. be angry uh-huh. or to like have that anger. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So from this point on, um, spoiler alerts. We're gonna talk about the rest of the book. So if you are watching this and have not read the book and don't want to know, please exit. YouTube now. Um, anyway, uh, so Caitlin, what, like overall with the book, what were your thoughts as a reader? I kind of went through like a journey of liking the book a lot and then yep. not liking it and then like, whoa, this is okay. Yep. Like, okay, <laughs> yeah. like now this is dragging on too long. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I've been thinking about it since finishing it and I'm yeah. like, <sighs> like the author's note. Um, which I skimmed at the end, Um, Kelly Barnhill said that this came to her. She initially wanted to write it as a short story, and then it turned into a longer novel. And a lot of people on, like, Goodreads and other review sites have said, like, it should have been a short story. (laughs) Okay, okay. Long and bad. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, because I kind of think, well, it did wrap up too nicely for me. Mm -hmm. Like, there are a lot Mm of ties that were, like, completely like okay this is explained and then like we know what happened here and we know what happened here I I thought it ended very quickly for all that like the beginning and middle parts were so detailed and like so intricate and then it was kind of like we're done (laughs) yeah right yeah like I I really appreciated people say it dragged on and I kind of appreciate that because it built the tension yes built the tension of like the childhood like when you don't understand something and then suddenly like you have to choose whether or not you're going to revisit trauma or like misremembering or misunderstanding things. And like, you wouldn't get that if it were a short story as a reader, like you would maybe understand, but you wouldn't feel it if you hadn't been through chapters and chapters of like a young child, like narrating to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I, I wish it would have ended actually like, I think probably after like the prom night scene, like I kind of wish that I didn't get the satisfaction of knowing what was the deal with the dragons Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. like if she was ever going to be happy and 
like what was going to happen with like her sister cousin. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I yeah. agree. So you mentioned that you kind of went on a roller coaster of liking it and then maybe not and then really loving it. I feel like I was on a trajectory of like I started off and you know I am a binge reader. Like I pick something up and kind of no matter the like intensity of the book or the topic, like I have distinct memories of like one night binge reading The Kite Runner in high school. Like that is not a book to <laughs> binge read. <in. laughs> so like it's not that I don't binge read things besides like rom-coms. You know, I, I kind of do that across the board. And I got like 50 pages in and I was like, I have to pause like it mm. was, it was just like so many things happening and you have a child's perspective. And then like right off the bat, there were the, you know, reportings from Dr. Henry, oh whatever. Oh my gosh, I loved those. Which I, I grew to love. But in the beginning it was like, wait, I have like a six-year-old perspective and I have all these characters and I don't know anything about them because I only know what a six-year-old knows. And then I have this really, really wordy, like literature, scientific style, like article. And then I'm switching back and I was like, what is going on? And I just had to like sit with it. I mm -hmm. could not. And so I surprisingly read this book over many days because I know. And that was very odd for me. But I... Yeah. I didn't dislike it in the beginning, but definitely it was just such a different way of like reading and the style mm -hmm. that, yeah, it took a couple days for me to feel like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I yeah. get this. The other thing I thought at the beginning, and I'm curious um, what you will think, is as I was starting it off, it felt like, oh, this is this going to be something that is like phenomenal literature and will be like, you know, very metaphoric and like really what, like something to really dive into, but it won't be a fun read, you know, like, will, will it yeah. be something that you should use in like a literature class, but isn't like something you flip through on the couch. Um, yeah. And I, I think there's a place for both of those things, but I was also kind of like, oh, I want this to be a, at least a bit fun, like a bit, a bit nice to read. And I think in the end it was. I did yes. like really enjoy it. But in the beginning, I was like, oh my God, am I going to have to like get through this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was thinking I wished actually that like all the metaphor was a little bit more subtle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought that's what it was going to be. And then it sort of like kept explaining itself. And it would, it yeah. would get to a point where it would, it would explain itself too much. And then like, I just love Kelly Barnhill's writing in terms of like her dialogue and how she yeah. infuses emotion into it so yeah. masterfully yeah. yeah and so she would have these moments where I would be like oh my gosh I have to take a picture of this <laughs> yeah. yeah this quote um so yeah it, it was a little bit of both but mm -hmm. I don't know I I think she could have like cut it early kept mm -hmm. some of the mystery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm perfect for me in terms of like okay like if you've gotten this far you know what the metaphors are we don't need to like see it all play out. <laughs> right right speaking of characters and emotions what did you think especially about our main character Alex mm -hmm. um what what did you think about her kind of emotional journey throughout the book I mean I feel like it made a lot of sense yeah. like she's initially a child who is mm -hmm. a child, you yes. know, just kind of like <laughs> innocently going throughout life in a time and place where like children weren't explicitly like told how things worked. It was just like, yeah. this is how things are. Yep. She even has like a moment when she is like before her first period, like in school, Yes. they like yeah. have a unit where they're like, you know, bringing, separating the girls and boys and yep. talking about what's happening to your bodies. But like, even the teachers, like, in this explicit, like, this is what's happening, are just using metaphorical languages. Yeah. And, like, our character is, like, I don't know what that means. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, what's, what's the flower mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like, she's very confused. And then we get to a point where she's, like, all of a sudden, like, this intense amount 
of responsibility Mm -hmm. is dumped on her at the same time that like a bunch of trauma is happening. Yeah. And so she just gets like angry and stubborn and like, I don't know. I really felt that. I was like, yeah, of course she would. Like if she wasn't angry right now, I would be like, I would be done reading this book. Well, and she was really confused by her anger. I feel like that was really well written. I think in some books that are portraying teens especially teens experiencing trauma they're like I'm angry because this 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 and this Alex she like blew up at the librarian and she was like I don't know why I'm doing this because I love this woman she's incredible she takes care of me she takes care of my sister she's the source Mm -hmm. of knowledge and I'm yelling at her and she was like so confused and Mm -hmm. yeah I I really loved that like I hated it but I loved it because it was like this is true yeah Yeah. all of those like pivotal moments like when her dad drops her off at the apartment and she's like like that internal like simmering rage and confusion and then the explosive rage at the librarian like both of those moments I was like jaw dropped (laughs) like oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh and like they were just so well written. They just so captured like what she was feeling. And I like really felt everything that she was feeling in those moments. Yeah. So speaking of both kind of the, that level of emotion and then, I don't know, possibly metaphor, possibly just the writing, maybe I'm way reading into this. I felt like there were some things that Alex was like so emotional about and didn't understand. And then other things that she like was clearly very good at science and math and didn't have a lot of friends, maybe circumstantially, we don't know. I kind of felt the vibe all along that maybe there was a bit of also like mm, autism going on or like something else at play that wasn't really being spoken about because there were some things that she just like couldn't understand about social situations that seemed more than just like dragons or I don't know. Yeah, I could see that reading of it. I could also just see, like, what we know about, like, these, like, perfect expectations of what, Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. the 50s housewife were, which, like, her mother and her father very much projected onto her. Mm -hmm. Like, she just never was, she never saw examples of, and she was Mm -hmm. never taught um, emotional maturity. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. she had no way like, of like know. knowing like, how are you supposed to feel and express yeah. yourself? And like, I think that was very common of yeah. that time. Yeah. Um, and even like she, Oh, I forget her, like her friend's name, Sonia, Sonia. Mm-hmm. Um, she has a childhood friend, Sonia, mm-hmm. for a time, mm-hmm. and she goes over to Sonia's grandparents' house. Her mm-hmm. grandparents raise her. And, like, I think, like, that's a good example of, like, she goes there and she describes it as this, like, magical place. Yeah. And I think what she thinks is magical is just loving. Yeah. Yeah. For she sure. get that anywhere. Yeah. And so it, like, seems like this, like, foreign well, difference yeah. Yeah. thing that, like, is just a special Sonia thing, but, like, she doesn't realize that, like, you can have that. <laughs> and, like, I'm so sorry that you were never taught that. That, the, so the Sonia element, um, I think that was a really important thing as well because it was helping Alex and, like, portraying her as going through, like, kind of a coming into her own identity and maybe sexuality and also making friends. Um, but at the end... I, I I felt like that was wrapped up in a very bizarre way that yeah. we had so many chapters of her and literally in the writing, I loved it. She would be like, Sonia, Sonia, Sonia. And she didn't know why. She was just like, I'm obsessed with this girl and mm-hmm. didn't re- really recognize like, was it romantic? Was this just friendship? Like what is going on here? And we get yeah. through this whole book and then finally they meet again. And then it was like, Sonia left and then I married someone else. And it's like, Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Well, and I think that kind of gets to, like, what, like, there are many layers of what it means to dragon in terms of, like, Mm -hmm. the metaphor, right? Like, there's, like, the righteous anger of expression. Mm -hmm. There's, like, breaking out of this, like, role, like, role of wife in the nuclear family Mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. And then there's just, like, what does it mean to, like, 
break out of yourself and expand mm-hmm. beyond like anything like you ever expected of yourself. Right. Like, not just like right. what other people did, but like pushing past your own limits. Yeah. And not that like Alex doesn't do that because she's so smart and right. she right. does achieve a lot in terms of like her like science. And yeah. Like, like clearly academic brilliance here. Yeah. yeah. But I saw like that moment of like her and Sonia are finally in like a beautiful relationship mm-hmm. and Sonia's like, I, like it's happening. Like I'm going to yeah. drag it. She talks about um, her, how she thinks her mother has like traveled through the universe to like yeah. look at yeah. their galaxies. And I was like, oh, this is just like, sometimes that happens in relationships where like two people kind of like they grow and grow and they love each other so much. Mm-hmm. And like one of them or both of them, but mm-hmm. in this case, one of them realized like, I need to be so much bigger than this. And yeah. like, yeah, you can't match me there. Yeah. And like, that kind of makes me sad. Cause I'm like, oh, my God, it's just, <laughs> like, are some of us just doomed to like never reach for that bigness? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. <laughs> well, that, that is a really good point. And I feel like it's interesting because they did express so many times and the author expressed that women who wanted to and recognized they were dragoning, felt bigger on the inside than they were on the outside. And they just wanted to like expand themselves, which mm-hmm. I thought was a really great way of describing that. But Alex also was expanding herself consciously not dragoning. Right. And it's like, wait, she's achieving, she's learning, she's growing, she's constantly becoming a better version of herself, mm-hmm. but she's not dragoning. And I yeah. like that she didn't. I actually quite enjoyed that. I think it would have been a little bit too heavy handed to be like, this was just her journey until she became a dragon and then the story yeah. is done. <laughs> so I like that she didn't, but it was also kind of like, so she was still a full person, well-rounded, brilliant. I don't know, kind of some confusion there. The other thing I wanted to ask you about Because definitely this whole book, especially in the 1950s, and as you've mentioned, like kind of vibes of housewives and all of that, it seems like the dragons are used as a metaphor for like women's female empowerment kind of stuff. But then as the book goes on, and especially as kids start to dragon, suddenly there are like signs up that are like only humans, no dragons, whatever. And it suddenly felt racial to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but earlier in the book, I didn't really get that vibe at all mm-hmm. that we were having a discussion about race. What were your thoughts via those two metaphors? Yeah, at that point, um, because, yeah, in the beginning, when we're talking about like the mass dragoning of 1955, <laughs> Um, the way everyone talks about it and the way that it's talked about in the narration is, like, it was the women. It was the mothers mm-hmm, who mm-hmm. dragoned. And then we sort of start learning, like, actually, this dragoning has been happening sprinkled throughout Forever. history, <laughs> for as far yeah, as we know, yeah. and, like, continues to happen mm-hmm. after 1955. Um, and then we get to a point where, like, it's happening, like, it's happening again a lot more frequently. Mm-hmm. And it's explicitly said, like, not all people who dragon are women. Mm-hmm. Um, and we start seeing younger people dragoning. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, the structures of like who's allowed in what buildings and whatever mm-hmm. very much feel like colorism and like race relation, like yeah. segregation stuff. Um, but it's also like, I was kind of like, okay, interesting. Like, like I think of like, race segregation because those are the clearest Mm -hmm. historical examples that we have of like this type of thing but like also just like queerness and like maybe because that's also like a huge theme of this story but like so many of these people like to drag in is to like embrace the queerness and not just in like sexuality or like gender but like queer in the the sense of the word of like outside the norms, the social norms. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I don't know. I was like, okay, like, I can see, like, the connection to, like, race, but I didn't feel like that was, like, actually 
what they were talking about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the other one I wanted to ask you about, so the, the two girls, after the mom dies, the dad just, like, dumps them into this apartment. Like, <laughs> horrifically tragic, like, yeah. very, very traumatizing. And it's, like, it's so easy to raise a kid. Like, just raise your sister while going to high school no yeah. big deal. Um, yeah. Like, it's so easy. I don't know what the fuss is about. And then just, like, leaves them there. And obviously it's a struggle, and the girls are doing everything they can to get through it, and they have each other. And that's, like, very touching and emotional, even though it is, like, horrific. But later on, this librarian, who has kind of been there throughout the story, we mm -hmm. learn that she has known that the girls we're living alone in this apartment for months, mm -hmm. maybe years. And this librarian seems to be like basically a wizard, right? Like yeah. she, she knows everything. She He's knows everyone. She absolutely is. And so even though I don't love when everything is just like perfectly tied up and it's like, Oh, here's this nice ending. Um, she knows everyone. Mm -hmm. And in her mind, she had said at one point, like, the, if the choice was social services or you guys being together, I'm choosing you being together. Mm -hmm. I feel like there were many solutions in between there. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that would have detracted from the story, if it would have taken away from the story in a certain way. But I don't know. When I found out the librarian knew, I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I think she um, made it seem like, because, yeah, she said, like, at one point, Alex was like, if you knew all along, like, what, like, what's the deal? And she yeah. was like, well, I had considered calling social services, but, like, if I did, like, you would have been separated. Like, that's yeah. just what happens. Yeah. Um, and, like, I couldn't do that to you. But I also think in that conversation – she so like she knows about it and figured out about it because she's a librarian and like they know everything. They know everything. <laughs> they can like figure out anything, which I think is true, and I really love that. But <laughs> I think like it took her a while to really catch on to the mm -hmm. extent of mm -hmm. what it was. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. she knew the dad was still involved in yeah. some capacity. Yeah, it was giving them money. To right, interact. right. The girls weren't working or anything like that. They were still in school. So right, yeah. So I think it took her a while to recognize the severity of the situation. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, Alex, like she was so deeply helping Alex apply for mm -hmm. um, like post-graduation, like educational opportunities yeah. and like going to school for um, an undergrad degree, which yeah. like was unheard of at this time ish. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think she was probably like, well, if she wants help, like, I, w I want to give will, yeah. her yeah. the autonomy to, like, ask for that. Yeah. Okay. But also, yeah. like, how dare you ask for help? Like, <laughs> ask for help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. So something that was, like, part of this story that, like, I don't know, like, I'm a little bit frustrated that it was in there because it seems so – random and it okay. was introduced so suddenly yeah. as if it was like part of the backstory all along yeah the knots okay yes I was like as I was reading that I was like oh Caitlin is going to be so into this like the symbolism I mean, I <laughs> um yeah when the mom was tying the knots around the girl's wrists and they were increasingly um, speedily coming apart, like as soon as the mom was doing it. I love that we got that little glimpse into the history and that women would have knots and they'd marry into a family and they would make new knots and the kids would have a knot and all of this. And then the mom died and it was just like, there are no more knots. But the mm -hmm. girls had things with knots. I don't know. And And like the very end, I think, Alex was wearing one of her mom's dresses and she made a reference to like the knots on the dress or something. But yeah, it kind of like came up and then it disappeared. And yeah, I know I wanted it to be I... there more because like as soon as it showed up, I was like, this is an example of how Kelly Barnhill like 
knows folkloric yep. things. Yep. Yep. Like absolutely. Knots like making knots and like weavings and like braiding. Yeah. Um is like a deep tradition across many different cultures. Um that is like a form of like witchcraft and magic. And you like make knots or weavings or braids and yeah. you like add in like your protection intentions or like mm-hmm. good luck or like mm-hmm. whatever you want it to mean. And then, yeah, in this book, they were talking about how um, I think especially in like Celtic not or British Isles, not yeah. history, yeah. like families would have like a signature knot. And that was mm-hmm. kind of like a crest. <laughs> yeah. Some form of like communication or something. Yeah, and then, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like throughout the story. And I think like, I don't know, that's like so part of it that like the mother didn't drag in and like she right. we, we, we learned that she like kind of knew that she could if she wanted right. to right and chose not to yeah and maybe even like created a knot to keep her from dragoning yeah and so in the, even in the very beginning there were the the knots and the like strings that she was wearing when the mom first comes home from the hospital and then the girls are wearing them yeah but we didn't get to learn a lot about the magic. And then again, it kind of goes to if Alex never dragons, why were the knots falling off of her wrist? Because she was very in control of not becoming a dragon. Beatrice makes sense, right? That girl was like a wild child. I'm, I can understand why the knots would not stay input like on, on her wrist. If she from infancy was like, I'm going to be a dragon. You know, of course that wouldn't stay on her. But yeah, yeah, we kind of missed out on that Yeah. in the end. I wish you would have known more about that. I I was happy, speaking of things kind of wrapping up, um, I was happy that the aunt came back and then it wasn't immediately a happy (laughs) reunion. Mm -hmm. And I think that that emotion was also really well developed in that, yeah, it had been years and the girls, especially Alex, felt completely abandoned by this Mm -hmm. aunt who by this age, when the aunt comes back, Alex recognizes she could have stayed, absolutely could have stayed. And so I was, I was happy with how they dealt with her kind of returning to their lives. Um, I don't know. What did you think? Yeah, I thought so too. I was, I didn't (laughs) like that the dragons returned at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Like at that point, it started getting a little too neat for me. Mm -hmm. Um, But if they had to return at all, like I'm glad that it wasn't like, oh, suddenly it's a fairy tale again. Like, yeah. No, because this person who was, like, a mother figure has been gone for, like, longer than these girls have been alive or, like, more yeah. of their life yeah. than not. Yeah. And um, if she can come back now, why didn't she come back earlier? And right. why did she bring it in the first place? I had a lot of questions about why – was it just people's awareness? Like, were the dragons – coming back and people like Alex when she's out in the woods or whatever and she's like is that a cow and it's like no it's a dragon um (laughs) (laughs) like were people just not seeing them because they were so unaware or unable to accept that reality and so were there always more dragons that were invisible but then I think that's a lot of the theme is like what do you, like, choose to allow yourself to see and experience and understand? Yeah. Like, what is hidden from you? But then, like, also, like, okay, once you have the realization, like, what do you let yourself explore and understand and, like, see the bigger picture of? And if you don't allow yourself that, like, you simply just, like, don't see it. Yeah. I think that she did a really good job of saying, like, people were all around but their eyes were looking at the sidewalk or like you know they were looking down and so even though like Alex was on the sidewalk talking to her dragon aunt she's like there were other people but they did not see her um yeah yeah that was interesting okay so overall Caitlin what did you think of like what would you rate this book and on what scale it's so hard for me because I usually don't rate books. I know, and I, I've expressed this before um, when I was speaking with Amber um, for the January book, but I have a lot of Goodreads 
rating anxiety because yeah. three stars is like good. And some days I like, I'm all up in my feels when I'm reading and I'm like four stars, five stars. And then later I'm like, that was a three star. And then I like go back and forth. And so, yeah. Um, I mean, if we're doing like a five star scale, or it could be out of a hundred points. I don't know. Like you, you do you, you do you. <laughs> I think I would give it a three. Okay. I think it could have been a higher rating if, again, it weren't so like wrapped up. I guess at the end. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's the type of book where, like I said, I like took pictures of it <laughs> as I was reading because yeah. there were passages that I was like, "Whoa, this is hitting me like very hard." But I don't know if I would read it again. But I'm glad that I read it. I I completely agree with that. I think if I were going from the perspective of like I am a teacher or this is for a class or like this is to dialogue with people about literature or about, you know, feminism or about, you know, whatever. I think in that case, I would give it four stars because I Mm. think it was really good for a lot of those kinds of purposes. Um, But I think as a book to read for fun, I would give it three stars because, yeah, I'm happy I read it. Absolutely. I don't know that I'll read it again, but I will recommend it to other people. So, yeah. 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 Any other last thoughts or comments before we wrap up? Um, I mean, I would say do check out The Crane Husband. Okay. The same author, her newest. Um, it's a novella, so it's like... And this think- is coming out February 2023? Yeah. Okay. So like, <laughs> Perfect. Either it's already out or it will be soon. <laughs> I think it's less than 200 pages. Okay. It's like similarly narrated by a child. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's weird. And I feel like for all the like critiques I have mm-hmm. of women, um, when women were dragons, like this one is like ends on kind of like a, I don't really know what that was about. <laughs> note. Okay. And I love that. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good to know. Okay. When, what was the title again? The Crane Husband? The Crane Husband. Crane Husband. Okay. We'll check it out. Well, Caitlin, thank you for being here and for reading this book with me and for yeah. discussing it today. It was Thanks so nice for to inviting see you. me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye, Caitlin. Bye. <laughs> thank you so much for joining in today and for listening to Caitlin and my discussion for When Women Were Dragons. I had so much fun reading this book, discussing it, creating something I hope you loved. The macrons I made inspired by this book. If you want to check out what everybody else made this month so far, make sure to check out the hashtag Maddie's Baking Book Club on Instagram. You can find what everybody else is making there. Leave me a comment down below if you have other thoughts or comments on this book. I would love to hear from you all. Next month, we are reading A Place at the Table. It is a really lovely and sweet book about two middle school girls going through all the things that middle school girls go through with a huge heaping um, amount of food um, throughout all of that as well. I'm really excited to get into that. I'll be discussing this next book with my cousin, Maria. So if you want to join in, make sure to check out the link and all of the information for that, participating, where to get this book, all of that is down below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you again here next time. Bye.